Hello, this is Ian Arden presenting to you today the challenges for energy storage in the UK. This is a subject I'm very familiar with. Uh, I've been the IMAK Energy Storage Champion for some years uh, and also the lead author of the 2014 report on the subject, which I will be referring to later. First of all, I want to start out with a recap on energy. Uh, the subject is energy storage, yet energy is not as well understood a term as we sometimes believe. First of all, energy is not the same thing as electricity. Many people in this country, and I'm so sad to say even engineers, seem to confuse the term energy with the generation of electricity. But in fact, energy for heating buildings and as vehicle transport fuel is far more significant both in the UK as a whole and in Scotland where I live in particular. So when we come to energy storage, it's important that we do not create the same confusion. The second thing is that energy is not the same as power. We describe generating and storage plant as so many kilowatts, megawatts, gigawatts. That's the power rating. But this refers only to the installed capacity, not how much energy the plant uses or produces. Energy is power used or produced over time and is usually measured in kilowatt hours, which is our familiar unit of electricity or in megawatt hours, gigawatt hours, terawatt hours, and so on. And most importantly, energy supply is only required to meet energy demand. Demand must be clearly known. So looking at UK's energy demand, and this is a chart I developed some years ago showing our renewable energy commitment for 2020, um, and uh, which is an overall 15% of all our energy. But what I'm using it for today is to show you the splits in uh, the different types of energy that we consume in our demand. This is not well understood in my experience. So if you look at the top right-hand corner of the, of the diagram, you'll see that electric power represents only just over a quarter of our total energy demand in gigawatt hours. Uh, looking to the left there, you can see that energy for transport uh, amounts to about a third of our energy demand, and the residual, the heat energy in the middle, is just over 40%. Uh, so easily the biggest area of energy demand is heat. Now in Scotland, uh, again, my particular interest uh, that rises to over 50%, uh, and yet uh, is rarely considered as a priority. We look further into this, this subject. These the charts are ones that we use um, to show uh, Great Britain's energy. It's called Great Britain rather than UK because it doesn't include Northern Ireland, which are part of the Irish system. The GB energy demand in gigawatt hours per day, you can see over the past seven uh, years, looking at those three particular categories. Uh, the, the red um, undulating line is our electricity demand. Um, the black stepped line is our transport fuel demand. And the blue um, peaks and troughs line is, is the heat energy demand. And you can see again that as well as being the largest single use uh, of, of energy, it's almost also the most problematic because, um, because it varies so greatly from summer to winter. Down at the bottom of this chart, you can see, or probably just about see, a red dotted line uh, along the x-axis with uh, 30 gigawatt hours uh, written above it in the bottom left-hand corner. Now, this represents the total of the UK's current energy storage capability, and you can see it's a very, very tiny number 
compared with our daily demand even of electricity, which is the smallest of the demands. Before we leave this chart, the important thing to note is that heat energy demand is so spiky and, uh, and intermittent that it's also very interseasonal. So we can't realistically meet that demand uh, by additional electricity generation, no matter what the government might think. Uh, and so we have to think of how we are going to um, solve that particular interseasonal problem when we come to energy storage. Next, I want to look at uh, the recent IMACI reports on the subject that I have already mentioned. And first, we look at the, uh, the April 2014 report, um, Energy Storage, the Missing Link in the UK's Energy Commitments. Uh, this was a groundbreaking report, and very it differed from all of the other reports with which I'm familiar anyway, uh, as uh, in that it uh, was the first energy storage report which comprehensively covered storage for heat and transport, as well as for electricity. I've given you the web link to download that if you haven't seen it already. And we went through all of the well-known energy storage um, types uh, which I'm planning to go through in a bit more detail in this presentation. But just very quickly, uh, there's pumped hydro. These are large-scale units, pumped hydro, compressed air, cryogenic or liquid air, hydrogen-based systems. Then coming down to smaller systems, pumped heat, flywheels, and then very small uh, superconducting magnetic energy storage, or SMEs, and supercapacitors. Then we moved on to the uh, more familiar battery systems, uh, redox flow type, lead acid, nickel base, sodium base, lithium base, metal air type. Uh, then looked at uh, hot uh, energy storage for heat. Um, this is not for electricity now, but for heat. And we, there are three basic types of that, sensible heat, uh, latent heat using phase changing materials, and then chemical reaction systems. And then finally, we did a section on transport where we looked at the five main systems available to us, um, biofuel-based systems, electrical systems, hydrogen systems, air or nitrogen-based systems, and flywheel systems. So you can see that contrary to popular belief, energy storage for transport is not a simple binary, um, either electrical or hydrogen solution that is so often peddled by governments uh, and, and others. The report made three main recommendations. First is, uh, as you all have gathered by now, uh, government needs to focus on heat and transport as well as electricity. Government must recognize that energy storage cannot be incentivized by conventional market mechanisms. Uh, and I have to say that government is still trying to do exactly that, uh, rather than recognize that they, these simply don't work in energy storage. And then thirdly, the UK must reject its obsession with cheapness in the energy sector. This is true of much more than energy storage, of course, uh, but it is a fundamental problem in UK policy in that cheapness is seen as more important than uh, the energy being of good quality and doing what we need it to do in terms of sustainability. Um, and these three points were not just criticisms. They were all designed to encourage government to take a properly integrated approach to energy policy. We do not have an integrated energy policy in the UK uh, of anything like the type that we will see later in Denmark and in, for example, Germany, where an integrated policy is seen as essential to success. We simply do not have that. And as far as I know, there are no plans for us to have such a thing any time in the near future. So we have to live within those very large constraints. We moved on um, from the energy storage report to produce a second report in June 2015, picking up on heat energy, the, the, which we called the nation's forgotten crisis, which built on the energy report, the storage report. It's not 
completely different. But it looked at sustainable means of supplying heat energy. And again, I commend that to your attention. Um, I'm not going to discuss that further at this point. We'll stick with the energy storage technologies that are the, um, the what this presentation is about. So the first point uh, I'd like to make on electricity storage is uh, um, is it's important to understand that electricity is not usually stored in any meaningful way. We're dealing with the storage of energy, which may then be released again at some future point as electricity. In storage systems, electricity is generated in the normal way, however you do it. It is converted into another form of energy for storage and then converted back again into electricity. This is what we call the round trip. So given the enormous demand for non-electrical energy that we saw on the charts, and that uh, amounts to over 80% of all of our energy in Scotland, it might make more sense not to convert all of the stored medium back to electricity, but to utilize it for the heat and transport energy sectors. And this is an area that, as far as I'm aware, is being given little consideration at the moment. So our 2014 report on energy storage notes that although most storage work done to date is for electrical systems, it is important to keep an open mind on this subject. Just to put in this slide to show uh, the government's interest, this was uh, something produced in September 2012 by the then uh, BIS, uh, which is the Department of Government, which has now um, been changed into Bayes, um, uh, and uh, incorporating energy. But it assumes that uh, energy storage is one of the eight great technologies that Britain can export to the world, and it's very difficult so far to see how we can justify this as we don't appear to be doing anything that nobody else is doing, um, but uh, we'll leave that one hanging. The final slide in this section is uh, a chart I produced to show uh, the classification of energy storage by technology and all of the systems I will be talking about uh, in the next few minutes fall into one of these categories. So it is not, there is some electrical storage, you can see that third down, that they're supercapacitors and superconductors, and they're so small that I won't even refer to them again. So you can see that they, what we call energy storage are either mechanical kinetic systems or thermodynamic systems or batteries or hydrogens and uh, hydrogen stroke electrolyzer systems or thermal systems. So it just reinforces the point that uh, although we are storing for electricity, we are not storing electricity in any meaningful sense. The largest energy storage systems we have worldwide are so-called pumped hydro systems, uh, or the usual acronym used is PHES. Uh, and these are very successful uh, and very popular. The schematic diagram um, shows a typical pumped hydro plant, and you can see the upper basin on the top left and the lower basin on the uh, lower right, uh, and the water flows in both directions. So it's based on the traditional uh, high head hydro system, um, but in a high head hydro system, the water flow is in one direction from the upper to the lower reservoir. Uh, that doesn't involve any storage. It works perfectly well as a generating mechanism, but it's not storage. In a pump storage hydro system, you allow the water can flow in both directions, and that's clearly shown on the chart. Uh, when power uh, power demand is is low, you can pump uh, water uphill to the upper reservoir, and then when power demand is high 
uh, you allow the water to flow down as in a conventional hydro system. And so it acts as a very large battery uh, and works extremely well. Very reliable, very well known. You can see from this uh, slide that there is enormous experience with this um, over uh, 100 gigawatts installed capacity around the world, uh, particularly in North America and in Europe and in what's called here Oceania, but that uh, includes places like China. Um, in the UK, we have four schemes, uh, starting from the bottom uh, in the order in which they were built, Festiniog in Wales, a small scheme, uh, then Cruachan in Scotland, a much larger scheme. Uh, Foyers in Scotland, a sort of uh, middle rating scheme. And then lastly, Dinorig in, uh, uh, in Wales, uh, built the last one built in 1984. Uh, and together, these, uh, uh, these four systems could, if they were all working in the same mode at the same time, could give us about um, 30, uh, the best part of 30 gigawatt hours per day, as I showed on a previous chart. Um, now, the question is, why have we not built any since 1984? And the answer to that is that these were all built um, during the days of the private nationalized electricity uh, uh, companies. Uh, and since privatization, uh, they have really been too expensive for the big energy companies to be able to afford to build um, uh, in the structure that we have in the UK. Uh, many of the American systems are, are built uh, without, um, without government intervention, uh, but then their system has always been different from, from ours. Uh, and it's difficult to know if there will be much change in this situation. Um, <clears throat> the two plants have been planned in the Great Glen in Scotland, that's between Fort William and Inverness, uh, Balmacan uh, and Corriblas. These are large systems, larger than anything we currently have, uh, 600 megawatt install capacity. Um, and uh, uh, But... Balmacan, I think, has been abandoned completely. Um, Corrie Glass is revisited every so often uh, by Scottish and Southern Energy who, who are promoting it, but uh, it's proving extremely hard to, um, to get the business case for the private sector to build such a plant, although it would make a huge difference to our energy storage capacity in the UK. Um, so, looking at the advantages and disadvantages, uh, pumped hydro is the only commercially proven large-scale energy storage system. It uses a, a commonly available operating fluid, water, which is important. Uh, disadvantages are it requires suitable topography. It's only suited to mountainous regions, so not suitable for semi-arid and lowland regions. Second system is compressed air. Uh, and this, again, is a fairly simple system. Uh, it's, it's the ambient air coming in from the left being compressed, stored in some sort of large uh, air reservoir, uh, often a salt cavern. Um, and then when demand is required, it's released from the storage at pressure, uh, expanded through a turbine, uh, and electricity is generated. The original type of system here, which is called the diabatic case system, um, show is what I've just shown you. Um, but obviously, the air, as the air is compressed, the the heat of compression increases its temperature very significantly, as well as its pressure. And as it uh, sits at that pressure in the in the storage reservoir, uh, the temperature will decay over time, uh, and so when you expand it through the turbine, you have to add fuel um, to warm up the gas, uh, because the gas will, um, will cool as it passes through the expander. Uh, despite that, it works, but the, the requirement for an external fuel source 
rather gets away from the idea of having a uh, a completely sustainable system um, because you usually burn natural gas. There are two systems in the world. Um, the first one at Huntorf in Germany, uh, built in 1978, um, a system that gives you three hours supply, and then a later one in McIntosh, Alabama, in the United States, built in 1991, uh, giving a 26-hour um, uh, energy supply. Um, these plants both work well, um, but they were enormously expensive to build, uh, uh, and the fact that they are both diabetic systems means that no further plants have been built. Um, uh, these are typical salt caverns, as you can see, they're, they're very, very large, which are used for the, the storage reservoirs. Uh, and this slide shows you how immense these are. That's a picture of the Eiffel Tower um, superimposed on a typical salt cavern. Uh, very, very large volumes indeed. And obviously these don't happen uh, or occur in many places around the world. As far as the UK is concerned, we have uh, a few um, salt-bearing basins in the UK. You can see around Teesside in, uh, in the northeast of England is, is well known. Uh, Cheshire Salt Basin in the, uh, uh, in the northwest of England and some down on the, uh, on the Dorset coast. Um, the uh, the Teesside area is exploited for this to some degree, and some work is being done uh, in Northern Ireland around Larne, which you can see in the top left corner of the, uh, of the diagram. Um, but there, you can only have salt caverns in these sort of areas, and so they're very geographically restricted in terms of what you can do. Um, the improvement on the diabetic system is the adiabatic system, uh, where the heat of compression is held in some sort of storage medium, uh, often oil or rock, uh, and is then used to heat up the air as it comes out of storage through the expansion turbine. Otherwise, it works in the same way. Obviously, this is more efficient because, and does not require a uh, an external um, energy source to heat the heat the air two of these uh, two of these units have been uh, are being being built in uh, called Adelia in uh, in northern Germany um, but they've been under construction for a very long time and we've been very hopeful of the outcome but it seems to be dragging on so the future of this is is still not very clear um, advantages, um, the, the, there are two utility scale systems worldwide, but a few more are planned. Importantly, it uses another commonly available operating fluid, atmospheric air, so there's no uh, shortage of supply or sustainability issues. Disadvantages are that it requires suitable geology. Salt caverns are ideal, but they need to be near to energy demand. Very low round-trip efficiency and less adiabatic, which is not commercially proven. So moving on quickly to uh, the next system, which is cryogenic, or known better in this country as liquid air. Uh, it uses liquefied air or nitrogen, uh, which can be stored in large volumes at atmospheric pressure. The process is identical to the well-known air separation plant system. Uh, very similar to case in terms of uh, compressors and expanders, um, and a 350 kilowatt demonstration plant operated at uh, high view power storage in Slough for some years. Uh, you see a picture of it there. Uh, that uh, that worked very well, um, but has now been uh, uh, dismantled because it's done its job but has been re-erected re and recommissioned at Birmingham University, where it is still in operation. The system is shown quickly here. Uh, you, you have, uh, uh, it's very similar to a compressed air system, a charging storage and discharging system, but it has the benefit uh, that you can include um, 
thermal recycling loops, a high-grade cold loop and a hot thermal loop, um, which greatly increase the cycle efficiency. A plant proving these has, is being uh, built at uh, a berry near Manchester, um, and uh, the last I heard was that it was very commissioning was taking place, but I have not heard that that is yet complete. Um, the advantages of cryogenic area storage is it uses well-known technology over 100 years of experience. Again, uses commonly available operating fluids, air or nitrogen, and no exotic materials are used in the process or machines. Disadvantages are that round-trip efficiency is not the best. It's a little better than, than compressed air, but it can be improved by thermal integration, but it's still nothing like pumped hydro. Um, fourthly, looking at hydrogen storage, uh, differs from the other three utility scale systems in that hydrogen itself has a high calorific value and is useful as a fuel rather than just as an energy vector. But unlike air and water, hydrogen is not freely available. And once extracted from other substances, it's extremely hard to contain as, is, as it is the lightest element in the periodic table. And thirdly, over 95% of the currently available hydrogen in the world is so-called brown hydrogen derived from fossil hydro hydrocarbons, so cannot be considered as sustainable. Uh, just a few facts there. As you can see, most of the uh, hydrogen currently in use is used in the refining and petrochemical industry uh, rather than for power generation. Um, <clears throat> when we look at uh, hydrogen uh, for energy storage, there are four main ways in which we can use this, and this makes, you, makes use of the fact that it is a fuel and not just a vector. Uh, first, power to power, uh, then power to gas, then power to transport, then power to chemicals. Uh, and all of these are feasible, but personally, I think the most likely uh, uh, efficient use of hydrogen is in the power to chemicals, where we don't really have any other truly sustainable feedstocks at this moment. Um, so advantages, hydrogen is a highly versatile medium, high calorific value, useful as a fuel. Uh, most hydrogen processes are well proven and should be scalable for utility scale, scale storage. However, there are real containment issues, especially at high pressures, and we're talking particularly in refueling vehicles at somewhere between 700 and 1,000 bar, uh, and this, uh, the, the, this is a, uh, a bit of a hazard which needs to be seriously considered. And it does need serious development work for hydrogen to be a truly sustainable fluid. It can be done, but at the moment it's an expensive way of doing it. Um, looking at the last of these larger scale systems, pumped heat electrical uh, storage, this is not yet commercially available, but instead of, it works on the same principle as the, the other four, but uh, instead, of, uh, instead of using um, air or water uh, as a, or hydrogen as a fluid, it uses heat um, and stores heat in one of the two containers. This was a system developed by a British company, I Isentropic, which has since gone out of business. But the, uh, the, the idea has been taken up by Newcastle University. Uh, where it's currently being developed. Advantages, uh, it already appears, although it's not commercialized, already appears to be a relatively low-cost system. All materials uh, appear to be sustainable. Disadvantages, this current demonstration is based on reciprocating engine technology, which is less reliable than, than rotary machines. And scalability is unknown at this stage. It, it's obviously a... a works at the small test sizes, uh, the, how big it could be escalated to depends on how big a tank uh, or how big the tanks you use could be in practical terms. So possibilities for the future and particularly attractive because of its low cost, but we don't really know where the, uh, the future lies with that at this stage. 
So looking before we get into batteries, let's uh, just look briefly at flywheel energy storage. We're not really doing anything on this in the UK at the moment, but the Americans have done something, the company, particularly Beacon Power. Um, and a high-speed flywheel is used um, uh, for energy storage, a uh, massive rotating cylinder supported on a stator by magnetic bearings, uh, and the flywheel is connected to a motor generator to, to absorb produce electricity. Uh, I should have said, although we're not using it for power generation in the um, use in the UK, uh, there are a few examples on uh, on transport vehicles, um, which we don't cover in this uh, presentation. These uh, individual flywheels are mounted into containers to meet higher power requirements. And here you see an example of uh, a large um, array in uh, New York State um, used for installed in 2011 for frequency regulation of the grid uh, and another in Pennsylvania uh, for the same purpose. Um, Beacon Power themselves uh, have uh, had problems and it's difficult to know where this, uh, this technology is going. The advantage is uh, high power capacity, um, low maintenance and long life negligible environmental impact. Disadvantage, of course, is low energy density, so it takes up a lot of space um, and uh, is, I think, unlikely to be a major contender in the UK, but uh, you never know in this industry. Moving on then to battery energy storage systems. Um, there's a chart here showing um, uh, the development of, uh, of different types of battery. Uh, and in the uh, lower left, the, um, uh, the heavier, la larger systems from um, nickel, cadmium, lead acid, so on, to flow batteries particularly. Uh, and up in the top right, where a lot of the interest is in the moment in, um, in lithium iron and metal air, for example. Just to look at those in turn, redox flow, this is... Uh, uh, a rechargeable battery in which electrolyte flows through one or more electrochemical cells from one or more tanks. It uses a charging discharge system, as we saw in the mechanical systems, um, and indeed is largely a mechanical system itself. Um, uh, there you see the, the diagram. Um, the, uh, this system was attempted as far back as 2001 in the UK at the uh, uh, at Little Barford in Bedfordshire um, using a bromine polysulfide uh, system. Uh, but it really had so many teething troubles that the project was stopped in December 2003 and has not been uh, revived. Uh, more recently, there was a project developed from the Isle of Gia in, uh, in southwest Scotland small island system, uh, and this uh, uh, redox flow batteries were, were built um, and were ready to ship to the island when uh, the electricity company came in and, uh, and uh, strengthened the grid so the batteries weren't needed, so they weren't installed. They have been reinstalled at a location in Cornwall, um, but I find it difficult to, uh, to get much information on that. So... Uh, um, so, so far, redox flow in the UK has not been terribly successful. Um, advantages, uh, there are many. Uh, it's economical, low vulnerability, uh, very flexible, high cycle lifetime, um, sustainable electrolytes. Um, um, the disadvantage is low energy density, so it's, it's, it takes up a lot of space. Um, and uh, it would be no use at all, for example, for, for transport systems. Lead acid, um, very well known, the oldest technology. Uh, I won't, This is well known, so I won't spend a lot of time on this. The largest energy storage system is a 40 megawatt hour system in Chino, California, dating from 1988. Um, this is how a lead acid battery works. This shows the uh, you're being used for energy storage um, as long ago as nine, the 1930s 
in Berlin in Germany. Uh, more recent systems, uh, this uh, one in Puerto Rico, a 20 megawatt system, uh, 1994, repowered in 2004. Um, low capital cost, huge level of experience, but limited cycle life, which is why they have to be repowered every few years, uh, uses unsustainable materials, lead is in short supply globally. Uh, this is not the, the technology for the future as, uh, in any real sense. Nickel-based systems uh, is a traditional battery type. It's been around since the 1910s, um, but it, and it provides long-life, reliable service. This is, again, how, it, uh, how the cells look. Um, here's a well-known uh, example of a NICAD system in Fairbanks, Alaska, uh, 27 megawatts up to 40 megawatts uh, commissioned in 2003. It looked to be the way things were going uh, by in those days, but that has largely now been overtaken by lithium iron. Advantages, high power and energy densities, high efficiency, but construction is relatively expensive. Materials are expensive and not plentiful. Sodium sulfide is a system uh, developed in Japan, very well used in Japan. Uh, here's an example of a 34 megawatt to uh, 220 megawatt hour system in Japan for uh, supporting a wind farm. Um, and, uh, but it's not really been developed anywhere other than, uh, than Japan, and an attempt was made to build one uh, in Orkney in Scotland, but was abandoned because of the concerns. It has high power and energy density, high efficiency, uh, but large production costs and also safety concerns. They have had tendencies to go on fire, which uh, is not very popular. Lithium-based, we're all becoming much more familiar with. Uh, they're rechargeable types in which lithium ions move from the anode to the cathode and back. Um, they've been very popular in, in vehicles, of course, uh, and, but also in, uh, in, in residential systems. Uh, starting out some years ago, um, 300 kilowatt system in Canada. Uh, more recently, 2013, a 2 megawatt, 500 kilowatt hour system in Kirkwall in Orkney in Scotland. Uh, and more recently still, a 6 megawatt, 10 megawatt hour system in Leighton Buzzard in, uh, in Bedfordshire. Uh, and you can, this was very popular with government. You can see uh, uh, in the bottom la uh, right uh, picture Amber Rudd there opening the plant when she was uh, uh, the Secretary of State in that, in, for energy. Um, larger systems are being built in the, uh, at the moment up to 30 megawatts uh, in Scotland. Uh, and these are good systems, but they're not genuine energy storage systems. They're used for um, balancing the grid, for frequency control and this type of thing. Um, and you, know, you can certainly build them up to very large sizes, but that's simply multiplying single cell technology uh, and it depends on the amount of space you have available. Um, high power and energy densities, high efficiency, but they have high production costs. They, they require special charging circuits. And there is the big question, of course, about the availability of lithium. Um, metal air type, we'll go very quickly through this because we were, we're not likely to use them for um, for power generation uh, storage, uh, and uh, that's what it looks like. Uh, the advantage, very high energy density, the most compact size, potentially the least expensive battery available, environmentally benign, readily available materials. But the big, big disadvantage is that elect char electric charging is difficult uh, or even impossible in many cases, and so they have to be replaced like uh, uh, conventional batteries. Right, general summary of, uh, of BEF. Uh, and I thought this was uh, useful. Although we have made great advances with the development of battery solutions, these are suitable only for short-term storage, in other words, minutes or hours at the most. As part of a future energy infrastructure, it will be necessary 
to use different options and energy forms in parallels, so said Professor Armin Schnettler of Siemens. Right, just quickly looking at energy storage for systems for heat. Sensible heat storage, uh, where thermal energy is stored as a result of a change in a material's temperature. Um, here's uh, uh, almost 14 million households in the UK have a hot water cylinder, giving a maximum combined storage capacity of around 80 gigawatt hours. Um, but we're replacing those uh, and losing that capability. However, uh, we still do do it. This is uh, this is a thousand liter hot water tank so attached to a, a log gasifying boiler that happens to be mine in southwest Scotland, uh, and also using heat bank systems, which is uh, also a shot from my own system. Um, but. Uh, these are used in other countries in very large sizes. This is the uh, Avadura system in Copenhagen, um, where you have very large heat uh, accumulators that you can see just at the back, two silver columns at the back of the power station there. Um, the, uh, you can have pr non-pressurized accumulators or pressurized accumulators, depending on the system design. Um, but then looking at longer-term hot water storage systems, the, the Danes, again, have done a lot of work in this field uh, with tank thermal energy storage, but that's restricted by the size of the tank, so they use thermal pits, uh, borehole systems, or even storage in aquifers. Uh, this shows an example of a borehole storage system in Bredstrup in Denmark, uh, or supporting a, a solar PV farm. Uh, and this also shows the thermal pit storage uh, in Aero Island in Denmark, uh, again uh, supporting a solar PV system. This shows the integrated energy storage uh, energy system in Denmark, including storage, and you can see that it incorporates power and heat and uh, and even waste uh, into a completely integrated system. Latent heat storage, thermal energy is stored and released as a result of a change in the material's physical state using phase change materials. This has been commercialized by a British company called uh, Sunamp, uh, also based in Scotland, uh, using their heat battery. And what this does, it shows a, a 3,000 litre hot water tank on the, uh, 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 the left-hand side and an equivalent size of a Sunamp battery uh, doing exactly the same thing uh, on uh, using phase change materials. Thermochemical heat storage, where heat is applied to certain materials to reversible chemical reaction. This is very much for the future, uh, and no systems are currently available. So just to summarize, energy storage systems are extremely diverse and cover a very wide range of technology types and scales. But as we say in Scotland, if we only had Loch Ness on top of Ben Nevis, so that's our deepest loch on, on top of our highest mountain, we'd be sorted. But we don't have that. Uh, and there will never be a silver bullet technology in energy storage. There will always have to be a very wide range of cap capacities and applications. Most large-scale technologies require specific topography or geology, which is simply not available in many places. Very few technologies are capable of wide-scale deployment by 2020, which is only 32 months away. Many technologies are at a relatively early stage of development and still need a large amount of investment and development. The UK government is investing little, and there is still no incentivization scheme for energy storage by the private sector. Front runners for deployment will need to rely on well-proven component technology and use sustainable materials and media. Despite being the UK's largest area of energy demand, heat energy is still the poor relation and heat energy storage almost disregarded. Nevertheless, energy storage is crucial. It is irrelevant how much electricity can be generated from renewables if it cannot be either used or stored. And that, I think, is the important message. Thank you very much for your attention.